here. Um, faculty, those that uh, could make it here today, and my, my friends and family who are very here. I thank you for being there. Um, Bob mentioned Marlise. Um, uh, he didn't have her stand up. She's all a five foot two. For those, <coughs> for those who need a conversion, that's 1.6 meters. Um, that's that's an engineering joke for my family. Uh, um, and we have been wonderfully blessed, as Bob has, has pointed out. I don't. Uh, I just did tease Marlise about her her height, but I don't tease her about her height because if I did, she would come back and rightly say. By small things or great things brought to pass, <laughs> and um, and she is my cherished friend and my my trusted advisor, and I'm grateful to have her. Many years ago, in an office not far from here, uh, I was talking with Professor Ulrich. Uh, he told me, uh, curiously, uh, he told me that there was only one profession that had a better success rate marriage than engineers, and that profession is the clergy. Um, I, have all, I have always always remembered that, and I wasn't asking him for such information, but it was, it was valuable to me to, to know that. Um, here, in, in this picture, I just want to make mention of some of my family, and you'll see why. Um, you'll see up there on the right, a stuffed animal, that's Lucky. Um, holding Lucky is Elena my granddaughter. Elena is held by her uncle Brant. It is Brant's birthday today. And um, I wanted to make mention of him specifically to the young ladies that aren't married. Because he's, he doesn't study here. He's in, uh, he's in the University of Texas, but he is very much unmarried. Just to mention. <laughs> Two roads diverged in the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one, as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step, had trodden black. Oh, I marked the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that. Caldera, my current employer in Provo, Utah, provides custom-engineered ser severe service components to mine sites throughout the world. We serve a niche that uses autoclave technology to process the ore. In the autoclave, slurry composed of water, pulverized ore, dissolved gas, and acid is decomposed at perhaps 250 degrees C and 42 bar to free up metal particles that for later extraction. The high pressure slurry is piped to a low pressure flash tank where megawatts of kinetic energy are dissipated non-destructively. The flashing flow into the tank is controlled by our ceramic trimmed titanium valve. The compressed liquid accelerates, generates steam, and expands through the valve to form a multi-phase supersonic flow. The the caldera valve performs its specific function in a corrosive and highly erosive flashing environment. Originally, there were two vexing problems. The valve seal is formed by a ceramic plug and seat, together known as valve trim. Occasionally, these ceramic trim components break during operation, resulting in temporary but costly shutdowns. This is the first problem. <coughs> The second problem occurs when supersonic slurry jet leaving the valve penetrates the tank's slurry pool and damages the erosion-resistant impingement block which shields the tank floor. Even with the shielding of the pool and the impingement block, the jet sometimes succeeds in causing severe damage. Both of these problems were enigmas at the time. 
From economics, we learn the value of specialization, that is, the division of labor, as demonstrated by Adam Smith's straight pin manufacture example in his 18th century text, The Wealth of Nations. So some become social workers, some musicians, some engineers, that is, electrical, mechanical, chemical, or civil, with even further specializations in acoustical, digital control, explosives, or structural, all engineering. This specialization creates arbitrary, arbitrary, excuse me, arbitrary partitions which, if not overcome, prevent discoveries and solutions to complex problems. Mother Nature pays no heed to our compartmentalization, so real-world complex engineering challenges often cross boundaries. This adventure of mine delved into disciplines of trim fracture and multi-phase supersonic flow finding root cause in automatic control theory. The erosion resistant impingement block ceramics are installed in a titanium stand that is mounted in the flash tank floor. The high speed jet can erode a hole in the ceramic, form large cavitation bubbles that break the ceramic, forcefully uproot the stand or some combination that results in a tank breach. My observations and understanding of first principles conflicted with industry expert opinion and analytical results in attempting to describe the high-speed behavior. Being a novice, I turned to understanding the basics. The fluid thermodynamics in this case consists of solid phase and liquid water which partially turns to gas and back again to liquid during the flashing process. The steam tables shown here in the form of a pressure versus enthalpy diagram are the foundation to applicable equation of state for the fluid. The flashing fluid by volume is predominantly ga gas flowing at velocities in excess of the local sonic velocity. Thus principles of compressible flow or gas dynamics Testing is an important but often neglected component of research. Initially, my best test data were internet photos of high altitude rocket plumes. My memory of the contrail of the occasional evening rocket launch at Vandenberg Air Force Base while we lived in Southern California. And perhaps most importantly, the eyewitness description of a two-phase water plume from Dr. Herbert Stadke of the Joint European Research Center. Professor Bob Chipman, who just uh, listened to, has reminded me that one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. I concur with the sentiment, even if I can't account for the ratio. In this learning adventure, I'm grateful for the late Dr. Craig Smith of the BYU Mechanical Engineering Department for teaching me the groundwork. Dr. Steve Gorell, also the BYU Mechanical Engineering professor, and the aforementioned Herbert Stadke for the guidance and assurance that my mathematical modeling approach was, was sound. And others like George Adigaraglu of the Swiss Federal Technical Institute, Jeffrey Hewitt of the Imperial College of London, and Christopher Brennan from Caltech for their pithy insights. Years back, we predicted a cone-shaped constant dispersion angle jet. In extreme cases, an explosively expanding flow pattern. Many in the industry maintained that the flow simply could not be understood. The following simulation results show how, how we now predict the flow. We have coded the model to display the results graphically over the full range of operation. Remember, this is all enclosed in the flash tank. My colleague, Dr. Joseph Prince, a recent BYU engineering graduate, has written much of the code to make this a practical engineering tool. Let me introduce the animation that follows. You will see later a graphical representation of the high temperature and pressure compressed liquid slurry flowing from the autoclave into the gallery of the caldera valve. As it flows between the ceramic plug and seat, the valve Seat, seat of the valve, it chokes and flashes to a three-phase supersonic flow. 
If there is enough nozzle expansion, a normal shock will form with supersonic flow before the shock and subsonic flow after. As the valve opens further, the supersonic flow structures change. The flow increases and the normal shock is pushed to the nozzle exit where it forms an oblique shock, after which the flow is subsonic. Still further opening results in extended and weakened oblique shocks, followed by the characteristic supersonic shock diamond pattern. Under certain conditions, diamond patterns will repeat. This is overexpanded flow condition. Next, the fully expanded condition often occurs when the valve is far from fully open. With no shocks to dissipate the kinetic energy, this supersonic flow most easily penetrates the slurry pool to damage the impingement block or tank floor. Last, the underexpanded condition immediately forms a shock diamond pattern without initial oblique shocks. Here also, the diamond pattern may repeat. You'll see all of those, those uh, patterns in the animation created. The valve is opening, the flow is increasing as these different structures form. This is the most destructive and we don't have time to go into just why that is. This plume, um, depending on the situation, will continue to expand or if the nozzle is smaller, uh, we can form a, a 90 degree uh, angle there to begin with. But the plume always will converge and collapse back on, on itself. And this was important for us to, to know at the, at the time. Again, I don't have time to go into, into, into that. In research and modeling, I'm inclined to staying close to first principles such as these. To me, there is safety technically and more importantly, eternally, in putting faith in things which are not seen, which are true. Part of the former and current models is the calculation of the compressible flow prample meyer angle. These original thermodynamic equations faithfully calculate the needed property values, and I believe them to be exact. However, a desire to find a comprehensible mathematical link to the physics led me to these concise equations which directly link the calculation to first principles. Pardon me if I find such things beautiful. Don't trail off. So, so, for, for Bob's sake and those in the back, pardon me if I, if I find such things beautiful, like a sunset. As a test, rectangular titanium plates were installed in a flash tank. Several months, after several months of operation, the eroded corners of the retreat plates marked the curved plume profile as predicted by the model. The controversy was authoritatively resolved and has led to effective solutions to impingement block and tank damage problems. While working on modeling, the the flow, my colleague, the late Roger Peterson, directed me to resources to help me identify the disciplines germane to ceramic trim fracture. Data came a bit at a time. Solid mechanics is used to calculate strain and stress. Thanks to Dr. James Varner of Alfred University for his introduction to fractography, that is, the study of brittle fracture surface features and to Dr. Tracy Nelson of the BYU Mechanical Engineering Department for classroom fracture mechanics training. Lastly, thermal elasticity correlates heat transfer from the flow to ceramic strain, which results in, in a stress field that yields a crack propagation probability according to principles of fracture mechanics. 
fractographic features of hundreds of ceramics have been examined, searching for clues to fracture sources and to compare with strain and stress field analyses. <clears throat> it is seemingly universal but unintentional to have hard pebbles in the slurry that are sieved and crushed between the plug and seat. The resulting sea or cone cracks are an important element of the complex fracture process. <clears throat> Trim sizing and flow modeling exercises quantify thermal gradients and shocks. That thermal data is used as boundary conditions for, thermal elastic, for the thermal elastic analysis of solid body strain and stress, like this performed by my colleague Rock. Grant Brockbank. Severe operational thermal shocks are sometimes sufficient to catastrophically fracture the plug. More often, thermal events work to extend smaller cracks as part of a progressive labyrinth to eventual failure. The propensity to fail by fracture of a ceramic is characterized probabilistically and expressed by a pair of parameters. The mod 